Now, putting the officer corps of the army under my focus from April 1962, I got the impression that a terrible conflict was inevitable because the officers had widely different qualities. First, there were the Sanos trained officers who had undergone a total of three years training before they were commissioned. Almost invariably, they were real soldier-like officers who knew the art of the game. Almost invariably again, they had imbibed the British officers' aloofness from politics and nationalism. 95% of them had never studied politics and were really not interested. They would without hesitation and more or less without thinking of it, do whatever the politicians commanded them. They would open fire on innocent citizens without batting an eyelid. In addition, a good percentage of them readily and willingly hobnobbed with politicians in order to attain the highest ranks and positions. That was the kernel of the inevitable conflicts. The second group consisted of young months trained officers who were commissioned after just a year of military training in Nigeria and Britain. Unlike the Thanos trained type, they were not hybrid officers and were actually supposed to continue their training within the army. Needless to say, they also had read nothing about politics and were not in the least interested in the matter. Perhaps the only politics they knew very well was that of their own selection into the army it was based on the political division of the country, which considered 50% representation to the northern region. As a result, those who were not qualified to enter found themselves favored by the quota system, a factor that further emphasized the disparity in the qualities of the officers. Thirdly, there were officers who were commissioned from the ranks. These were soldiers who had served for some years before they were sent for officer's training. Most of them were commissioned for the services such as transport, education, and quartermaster services. Usually, they were older in age than the above quoted types. Some of them had attained high officer ranks by 1962 and were in fact holding the highest ranks in the army. While some were newly commissioned and were of junior officer ranks, all of them had been rigidly schooled in the British military tradition of total political aloofness and obedience to the politicians. They had not studied politics and most of them hooked themselves to politicians for promotional favours. This was another kernel of the inevitable conflict. Finally, there were the non-professional graduates in the fighting arms of the army. Actually, by April 1962, there were only six of us in this group. Majors Ojuku and Banjo, Captains Olutoye, Efejuna and Rotimi, and Lieutenant Ademoyega. At least half of us were manifestly imbued with political and revolutionary zeal and principles. Having thus analyzed the officer situation, it is necessary to substantiate these facts. As soon as I was commissioned in Aldershot, UK, and on my way back to Nigeria, I stopped in London and called the Nigerian High Commission. I went straight to see Lieutenant Colonel J.T. Aguiyuronsi, who was then the military attaché to the High Commissioner. I was meeting him for the first time, and having introduced myself, I asked him why the Nigerianization was proceeding rather slowly in the Nigerian army and why a British was being considered for appointment to replace the outgoing General Officer Commanding GOC. He explained to me that the decision lay with the politicians and that his own duty was to simply do whatever he was told. I knew that the Federal Civil Service was being rapidly Nigerianized and that the rapidity of the process was the achievement of senior Nigerian civil servants. Why could not the same be done in the army? To that, he replied that the British were very much on top in the army and it was they who handled the Nigerianization process. I prodded him much further to see if he would agree that a lot could be achieved by uniting pressure groups on politicians to give Nigerians such sensitive posts as could be used to hasten the Nigerianization process. He did not see this necessary and did not really want to quarrel with the system or hasten the process of change. I did not question him any further. I assured him that I would not waste time in London but would return to Nigeria immediately to join my unit. Ideologically, the core of the revolutionary officers had agreed on a program of action to be implemented if we had successfully taken the reins of power into our hands. This program covered all areas of politics, economy, education, social and foreign affairs. 
Politically, we believe that our immediate step would be to correct the worst anomaly of the 1957 constitution by breaking down the country into smaller units or states. In other words, the four regions which existed till January 15, 1966 were to die instantly and on their dead bodies were to emerge 14 states each, each of which would be conterminous with two of the former 26 provinces of the Federation, except Sokoto and Oyo states, which were to be conterminous with one province each. In effect, there would be seven states each in the former North and South. These were to be governed by military governors who would be chosen on their merit and loyalty to the revolution. We also believed in the immediate release of political prisoners of those days, namely Chief Awolowo, Jakonde, and Tony Anahoro, Onitiri, Omisade, and so on. We also saw it that these actions would bring immediate relief to the suffering masses of the West and North and would generate peace and conquer throughout the Federation. Economically, we agreed we had an extreme form of capitalism in Nigeria in 1965, which was not good for a newly emergent nation. Under that system, the vast majority of our people, that is to say about 99%, were extremely poor and lived in abject poverty, while the few millionaires were being created here and there all over the country by using their political connections to divert government's money into their hands. To be specific, there were government finance corporations and marketing boards which were used to divert public money into private hands by way of loans and inflated contracts. This system also favored the few middlemen whose palms were greased by this diversion of funds. The masses did not benefit but were improvised, thereby hence the ever-widening gap between the rich and the poor. No avenues were open to check or correct these horrible anomalies. Our revolutionary principles provided for a total change of that economic order. We plan to mobilize the people so that they would produce most of the things that they needed for the betterment of their lives. It was already established everywhere in the world that when people work collectively, they produce much more than when they worked individually. Therefore, farms were to be enlarged for the people, not grabbed from them and concentrated in one or two hands, as happened and still continues to happen to this day. Under our planned revolutionary system, workshops were to be collectively built for artisans and tradesmen to practice their arts and trade communally. They were to collectively enjoy the benefits of mechanization and automation adequate provision of infrastructure such as access roads, water supply, electricity, houses and recreational facilities. They were also to enjoy adequate availability of raw materials, good and stable prices and marketing facilities. Transportation was to be facilitated by the fusing of our transport services into a network so that transporters could work together to serve the people more efficiently. Under our planned revolutionary system, construction work would be done communally. House builders would work for the community planning and building such houses as were conducive to comfortable and decent living for all and sundry. It would not be possible for a man to steal money, escape imprisonment through bribery and corruption, use the stolen money to build a few houses, raise the rents to the sky, defy all the laws of the land with impunity by extracting five years rent from tenants only to start building more houses again and for the same purpose. Communal house builders will be made to put the interests of the community above personal interests and will be made to utilize local resources and encouraged to introduce innovations in construction methods. The government on its own part would make sure that such facilities and materials would be necessary for the smooth running of the jobs and constant employment were made available to them. Accountants and auditors would work collectively and scrutinize government accounts to make sure that public money was well managed and the accounts of corporations to ensure that investments of the people were maintained in good hands and in the direct interest of the people. Lawyers would work collectively by interpreting letters of the law the right way up and based on nation's constitution. In this way, they would bring the benefits of the rule of law to every individual and therefore to the community as a whole such that there would be no need for lawyers to condone lawbreakers, those who hold the society to ransom simply because they have the money or the force to do so. There would also be no need for lawyers to pursue other businesses like buying and selling, importing and exporting, constructing, transporting, hoteling and so on. Under our planned revolutionary system, the armed forces were to take part in civil productions working with professionals, artisans and tradesmen. 
They were to work with farmers and with public utility workers to distribute both water and electricity. They would encourage our workshops and factories to produce military weapons and defensive stores so that we could cease to depend on foreign nations for our own defense materials. The police would also have found it much easier to do their duties collectively to preserve the peace and orderliness of the community. In the first place, the police would cease to be remote from the people. They would not always wear uniforms. They would be found in workshops and factories, in the offices and public places, in the shops and markets, and in the streets and hotels. They would generally brief the people on what was legal or illegal in their proposed actions and would promptly bring offenders to book. Our revolutionary society would have no need for riot squads or for the armed police. People would be willing to come forward to give useful information for combating crime. Under our planned revolutionary economic policy, every individual would work as a member of the composite community. The goods of the community would be equitably distributed and everybody would have his own fill for the money would go round. It would be impractical for a single man to spend 2 million naira to build himself a personal house, while a very large number of Nigerians in the same community dwell in hovels and sleep in the gutters and under bridges. The government would not cater for the interests of a few people while denying the great majority of Nigerians their rights and privileges as happened with the Obasanjo government. The government helped a few Nigerians to make easy millions of naira through oil distributorship while denying the majority of Nigerians their rights to obtain loans to buy motor cars on the selfish declaration that it is not the intention of the government that every Tom, Dick and Harry should own a car. Educationally, we had agreed that there was only one answer to the mass illiteracy that troubled Nigeria in 1965, namely mass education, both formal and informal. This was deemed essential to lift the vast majority of our people out of the bog of ignorance and disease, to make every individual a productive part of the community and to destroy the people's enslavement to myths, misconceptions and superstitions. It was also necessary to liberate the minds of the people from darkness to keep them informed of the truth and to make them appreciate the need for the revolution and for a new way of life. Moreover, the people, especially in the north, had been exploited for a long time and had become inured to suffering so that they no longer knew or fought for their rights. Rather, they acquiesced in their suffering, blaming their man-inflicted wounds on the will of Allah whereas Allah was totally opposed to such human wickedness. Mass education was therefore essential to awaken the people to their rights and responsibilities for their own freedom. Under our planned revolutionary education policy, it would have been possible for our elementary children to know the various herbs of the forest, the various seeds that are planted in Africa, the seasons and their significance in their own locality, and how these vary in other localities and climates. Socially, we realized that the society was split into two broad divisions. The privileged class that were housed in government reserved areas, GRAs, and the masses who lived in the slums. This was inherited from the British administrators who lived far away from the people they governed. The separation of quarters and the difference in living standards brought a great cleavage into the Nigerian society such that government officials and newly elected political officers such as commissioners and ministers moved into the GREs. Once they were so uplifted by the society, they became solely and wholly motivated to use every opportunity to lift their immediate family out of the level of the masses into the privileged class and also to keep themselves perpetually in that class and totally abandon the masses. This was the main reason why some of them became in the main sit tight and irresponsible ministers and commissioners as well as rabid, fraudulent and corrupt officials. Once in office, their aim ceased to be with the care of the masses but simply how to keep themselves perpetually on top and privileged. Under our planned revolutionary social system, the cleavage in the community would at once be obliterated so that the community would be one indivisible unit. The post of Obas, Obis, Emirs and Amayanabos constituted the greatest anachronism in the Nigerian society of 1965. These natural rulers were useful instruments of corruption and compromise, first under the British and later under the Nigerian politicians. Of what use to the society were those glorified idols 
that had eyes but would not see and had ears but would not hear were merely served as conduits to pass a bribe to the people in order to miscarry social justice. Many of them were diabolical and their continued existence is inimical to social takeoff and progress. The popular television series created by Shegun Ulushola entitled The Village Headmaster has simply illustrated to the Nigerian public the parts being played by these so-called natural rulers in the society. Whenever any matter was hot and demanded immediate action to punish the evildoer and save the society, the Oloja of Oja, Oba Adenwele II, as he was styled in that program, would simply pontificate, moralize, threaten heaven and hell, and then would take absolutely no action in the matter, thus letting the sleeping dog lie and of course letting the grass grow under his feet. In the end, it was the ineffectiveness, the conservative and the changeless part of the Oloja as the leader of men in the village team that killed every member of the village and the Oloja himself, so that the series came to a natural end. Under our planned revolutionary social system, these anachronisms would be quickly brought to an end and the good people so wrongly employed would be integrated into community development projects. On foreign policy, we agree that the approach was not in tune with the thinking of the majority of Nigerians. Nigeria spoke with uncertain voice at the United Nations. She seemed always to act as the mere outpost of the British sphere of influence in Africa, as if she was tied to the apron strings of Western powers. Although she proclaimed herself a non-aligned nation, yet she was always told the Western line in her international politics. It was our intention to quickly reverse these tendencies in order to match our professed non-alignment with relevant action and so open a new era of strong, virile and principled foreign policy. Most Nigerians did not realize that this country had very powerful instruments of coercion which she could effectively employ to influence the trend of affairs in internal politics. It was the aimlessness of the Sadauna Balewa administration that made her seem impotent and helpless in the global affairs of 1965. Moreover, Nigeria's posture of anti-communism and of non-involvement with the communists did her more harm than good. She had a lot more to learn from the social and economic organizations of those countries than she had been learning from the rabid capitalists of the West. Nigeria would have made friends with the Eastern countries and educational exchange programs would have been arranged so that our students could attend their higher institutions to acquire scientific and technological knowledge upon which they would build. This program would have been extended to our politicians, social workers, economists and civil servants in order to let them see other ways of tackling problems and know that there were alternatives to the western solution they were used to. In this way, Nigeria would have emerged a country with very strong legs to stand upon. She would have seen things more clearly like a nation that had discovered the use of her second eye. We would have started to speak like a people who had learned to use their brains. And we would have started to perform like men who have a destiny. This was our stance. We cherished the ideology and discussed it like brothers, very often at the officer's mess and in working units. We had no need to doubt that we would accomplish our task. Thus, we began to prepare for the great day that would mark the beginning of a definite effort to awaken the country from her slumber.